As I stand here today, I'm going to be introducing, I have the honor and privilege of introducing Lord Rothschild, who is our main speaker today. But I'm, I'm here, I've got two sets of feelings today. One is uh, pride, and I'm very proud of the fact of the fantastic work that was done by the World Center of Neighborhood, of which I have the honor uh, to serve as chairman in setting up this amazing conference, in particular, the work of Mr. Alan Schneider, our indefatigable, and I say that advisedly, director. <laughs> and also the other Alan, we keep talking about the two Alans, of the other organization, and that's Dr. Alan Weber. So we want to thank him very much for that. I'm also moved because here we are, you know, talking about one of the most momentous documents, and I think uh, the Prime Minister May was so correct in saying this is one of the most important documents, historical documents ever, certainly for us as Jews. But I'll tell you a very, very short story because I've been threatened and I'll be pulled off the podium. But a very short story, it's part of my professional duties. I was involved in an arbitration between two sections of the Christian community in Jerusalem over a piece of land, a momentous piece of land. And uh, it was decided to have an arbitration in Rome. So off we went to Rome to meet the two sides of this, and I decided to take my younger son with me. And I said to the group, as we met, I said, I need a hiatus of, of two hours in the middle of the day. I want to do something for myself privately. And when I came back, one of the prelates who we were presenting said to me, well, I'm very curious, what did you actually do in these two hours? And I said, well, I took my son to see the Arch of Titus in Rome. And he was very polite, and he said, why, why did you think that was a necessity? And I said, look, when you lose your sovereignty, as we did, and he's so, he's so encapsulated in the Arch of Titus, where you see the menorah and the captives, and that it was the last time that Jews had sovereignty, the Arch of Titus led in a direct line to the portals of the concentration camps, as far as we were concerned. It was important to me to show this to my son at least once, and I did, and I'm pleased that I did, and the Balfour Declaration was the correction of a huge wrong, was a step in the right direction, a step in restoring sovereignty to the Jewish people. I'd like to say to you that uh, our very, very distinguished guest today, Lord Rothschild, is the chair of Yad Nadiv, a foundation which continues the philanthropic work of his forebear, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, as well as supporting the building of the Knesset, which we're in today, the Supreme Court, and now the new National Library, Yad Nadiv supports a range of major projects to advance Israel as a healthy, vibrant, democratic society committed to Jewish values and equal opportunity for the benefit of all its inhabitants. Lord Rothschild is the great nephew of Lord Walter Rothschild, who 100 years ago was the recipient of this momentous 67-word letter containing the Balfour Declaration. Lord Rothschild was awarded the Weizmann Award in the Sciences and Humanities in 1998. In 2004, he received the Sir Winston Churchill Award from the British Technion Society. He's the, an honorary doctor of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and an honorary fellow of the City of Jerusalem and of the Israel Museum. In the United Kingdom, Lord Rothschild is one of the only 24 holders of the Order of Merit awarded by Her Majesty the Queen for exceptionally meritorious service in the fields of arts, learning, literature, and science. Lord Rothschild. thank him in his absence. Um, he couldn't be here because of parliamentary business. He's put on and been helped to create this extraordinary gathering today. And I'm greatly honored that the Knesset should have invited me and to speak today and to express my appreciation to all those who helped organize this fascinating symposium. Almost impossible to speak. Is Simon Sharma in the audience? 
I see some arms being raised, but it's not Simon. Um, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> now I introduced him last week at the Royal Society for the big lecture on the Balfour Declaration. And he spoke <clears throat> for an hour and a quarter without a note, completely brilliantly, and you could have heard a pin drop. And I think today, all the speakers were distinguished, but I have to mention Simon, who um, in a sense hasn't helped me because I'm going to um, talk quite a bit about my family. But in addition to um, his distinction as a speaker, some of you, I hope not too many of you, would have read his book of 40 years ago. It was his second book, and it was called Two Rothschilds in the Land of Israel. So he knows even more about that subject than my family or I do. So congratulations to him. And um, <clears throat> let me say this, um, which we've all said. This is the most astonishing, never to be forgotten gathering. Quite unbelievable. And I don't quite agree. Well, there's Martin Kramer here. This seemed to me to be, I mean, you're a distinguished historian, which I'm not, but it seemed to me that um, this was something which was driven by people rather than by events, although events, of course, were incredibly important. But people, it would never, ever have happened without the extraordinary efforts, unexpected efforts of people. And as Heimweizen said of it at the time, it represented the Magna Carta of Jewish liberation, a decisive event in Jewish history. As we all in this audience know, it's taken, it took more than 2,000 years for the Jews to recover their historic home. And I remember my, our trustee and great friend Isaiah Berlin a few years ago um, told me that Hein Weizmann had said of this, miracles do happen, but one has to work very hard for them. And I suspect that as I look round this room with lots of friends and lots of people who I respect and recognize, I think everyone in this great gathering has contributed to the miracles along this long road. It, it's a truly great honor in a way, it's a strange story, bits of it, for our family, that the letter containing the Balfour Declaration was sent to my great uncle Walter, the second Lord Rothschild, and delivered to him at his home in Piccadilly. I'll come on to him and explain why it was strange in a minute or two. But long before Walter, about 40 years or so, Baron Edmond of Rothschild, who was French, was deeply moved by the programs that were going on in Russia, anti-Semitism, and violence in the Pale of Settlement. And this led him to believe that a refuge for Jews from persecution was essential. But it's fair to say he looked for more than a refuge. Above all, he was inspired by the vision of the rebirth of the Jewish spirit in this ancient land. Uh, this is what he wrote about that subject. I didn't come to your aid because of your poverty and suffering to be sure there were many other similar causes of distress in the world. I did it because I saw in you the realizers of the Renaissance of Israel and of that ideal so dear to us all, the sacred goal of the return of Israel to its ancestral homeland. And he was inspired to support not only the physical and economic needs of the fledgling communities, but also the intellectual and spiritual dimension of their activity. He saw the creation of the Hebrew University as a great event in modern history of Judaism. And he was amongst the first to support the revival of the Hebrew language. Indeed, Eliezer ben Yehuda, the father of modern Hebrew, who wrote those wonderful volumes of his dictionary. He dedicated that dictionary uh, to him. Having said that, 
whose relationship uh, with the settlers was not an easy one. He thought at first that it would take between one and three years before the settlements could achieve economic independence. Within these settlements, it's fair to say that both the Jews and the Arabs benefited. But the Baron had been over optimistic, and the difference of outlook between the early Zionist pioneers were mainly concerned with challenges of security, epidemics, and subsistence. And the Baron, not surprising, his, his ambitions were rather more sophisticated, including not only the making of wine, but also at various stages, tobacco, silk, and perfume to furnish the drawings of Europe was not without its tensions and often lively, sometimes disagreeable correspondence. Fortunately, the relationship survived the frustrations of those early years that followed and contributed to an unimaginable transformation. In 1867, Mark Twain had described Palestine as a hopeless, dreary, and heartbroken land. By the time Baron Edmore made his last visit to Palestine in 1925, it was altogether different. He spoke, I think, very movingly in the great synagogue of Tel Aviv. So he reminisced, when I look back on the stretch of land where I began my work, I recall how Palestine appeared in those days, a rocky barren land full of thorns. Today it seems to me that I'm in a dream. Without this the Jewish presence in Palestine, without the great progress which this presence brought about, the second great story, the story of the Declaration itself, with which my family was so involved, might well not have taken place. Let me go back to the summer of 1902, when Nathaniel, the first Lord Rothschild, was finally to meet with Theodore Herzl. Although at first he was somewhat skeptical about Herzl's Zionism, he became increasingly impressed by Herzl's vision. He helped Herzl through introductions in opening up the gates of the British establishment to a legendary Jewish leader. And as a result, Herzl was able to develop relationships with prominent ministers and the government of the then Prime Minister, Arthur James Balfour, before becoming Secretary, as most of you will know, he was Prime Minister. And Herzl obtained our support for building the Jews a home in northern Sinai or in East Africa, which he saw as a stepping stone towards Palestine. Now, the seeds that Herzl planted germinated some 15 years later by when Balfour was serving as foreign minister. And how Bautzmann, along with Nathan Sokolov and others, took upon themselves an extraordinary diplomatic mission in the waning days of the Great War. Nathaniel's eldest son, Walter, came to play a central role together with Baron Edmund's son, James, who had moved from France to Britain, in part following the horrific anti-Semitism revealed by the Dreyfus Affair. In England, he married Dorothy Pinto, who made an invaluable contribution to the process that culminated on November 2, 1917, when Lord Balfour sent Walter his letter, which would change the course of history. The story of Heim Weizmann is an almost unbelievable one. He was a, an immigrant chemist who came to England and through his charm and brilliance and passion, as well as his scientific contribution to the war effort, won over the British leadership. And that's well known. Not so well known is the story of how he gained access to the British political establishment which was crucial to his success. He had been very keen to meet Baron Edmore, who had been involved for 40 years or so before. But he lived in France. So he was to meet up with James 
and to gain his support. But then, not only was Edmore living in France, but his son James was injured in the war and couldn't really participate. Therefore, fell to his wife Dorothy, still a teenager, to meet with him. And their relationship developed. He wrote to her <clears throat> no less than 33 times between 1914 and 1916. So, through Dorothy, James and Walter, the second Lord Rothschild, the door to a significant circle of the British establishment was opened. <clears throat> the campaign for a Jewish homeland had to be waged against opponents of Zionism, as you heard earlier today from Simon Sharma. He gave as an example Adrian Montague, a leading Jew and a member of the British cabinet, who was passionately pro-assimilation in England, for Jews, as indeed were many members of the leadership of the Jewish community who were fearful that the equality and liberties which the Jews had so painstakingly won in Britain might be jeopardized. Jewish community leaders who opposed the declaration went so far as to write a letter of the time saying, support for a Jewish home in Palestine would have the effect, I quote, of stamping the Jews strangers in their native lands. <clears throat> I'd like to make you smile by going back to the somewhat surprising role of Walter Lord Rothschild. He was a dramatically different character to his father. No banker, but he probably fired from the bank. An extraordinary eccentric whose overriding passion was to assemble the finest private collection of zoological specimens in the world. At his museum in, as his museum in Tring, he had accumulated 225,000 moths and butterflies, 300,000 bird skins, and some 145 live giant tortoises, including the largest, some 150 years old which he would ride on in the Rothschild Park of Tring. <laughs> and in London, you may have seen the photograph um, in the little exhibition that is taking place here. His carriage was drawn by zebras. <laughs> he was introduced to Weizmann <clears throat> by his Hungarian sister-in-law, Rezica, <clears throat> who was married to his younger brother, Charles. Completely captivated became a passionate Zionist. Deeply involved and committed, he gave his time and contacts to the cause. And he soon came to be seen as the lay leader of the Jewish community, which is why the declaration was addressed to him. He described the declaration as the most important moment in Jewish history in the last 1800 years. And the historian, Sir Charles Webster, described Weizmann's role as the greatest act of diplomatic statesmanship at a grimly undecided stage of the First World War. The Declaration, it is a somewhat ambiguous letter, didn't guarantee the success of the Jewish Renaissance in Israel, nor did it guarantee continued political support of the project as sometime later British policies would show. As Balfour himself said in a speech, marking the 10 years of the Declaration, it doesn't give Palestine to the Jews, but it gives them their opportunity. It's for the Jews to make the fullest use of this opportunity, for which they prayed and waited for 2,000 years. Now today we ask ourselves, what does the balance sheet look like 120 years after the Dreyfus case in France, 73 years after World War II, and well now 70 years since the foundation of the State of Israel? On the diplomatic level, Israel has relations with 150 states, embassies in over 100 countries. Its technological and development expertise is sought by countries across the world. And what a source of pride it is 
that so frequently in times of disaster and need, Israel's talented aid teams are among the first on the ground to help. And here in Israel, the struggling pioneers brought forth a free, democratic society, a post-industrial economy with astonishing technological achievements. The country provided a home for refugees, many of whom were the victims of persecution, and who provided a burst of skill and energy, particularly following the Russian immigration of the, of the, 18, of the 1990s. On the cultural level, it's given birth to an explosion of cultural and literary expression and renaissance of the Hebrew language. How striking it was to see that two of the finalists in last year's Man Booker Literary Prize, the eventual winner, winners were Israeli authors writing in the revived language of the Bible. So in one sense, the Balfour Declaration has been fulfilled. In many ways, beyond its drafters' dreams. But it's not only a historic document, it's also an aspirational one. It sets out a vision of a society which is guided by Jewish values and which ensures equality to all its non-Jewish residents. And in both of those missions, while much has been achieved, of course it's still a work in progress. It's fitting, it seems to me, to mark this centenary here in the Knesset, which symbolizes the success of Israel today as a democratic sovereign state with recognition across the world. For me, it's particularly moving to be here in the Knesset, the building which James and Dorothy gave to the State of Israel. Furthermore, the foundation established, established by Dorothy in memory of James, which I've had the honor to chair, is committed to playing its part in fulfilling their vision and beyond, to nurture Israel as a healthy, vibrant, democratic society, committed to Jewish values, an equal opportunity for the benefit of all its inhabitants. And can I take the opportunity of thanking Ariel Weiss, who runs the foundation, supported by Daniel Torp and 40 other people in Jerusalem, for the magnificent work that they've done. And there's hope for the future. I've got um, Hannah, Beth, three grandchildren here. So although we've been in Israel <laughs> for 150 years, <laughs> we may be there in another 150 years. We never know. As we mark this anniversary, with extraordinary pride, we do so, I believe, with an awareness of the road yet to travel. I think we all know that the hardest battle of all, peace, still lies ahead. We know it will take time, endless effort, thought, goodwill, judgment, faith, energy, and courage. And I think we would all agree that these virtues are not in short supply. I want to end my remarks by looking back to the 10th anniversary of the Declaration 90 years ago at a dinner which was given by my cousin James de Rothschild at the Savoy Hotel in London with words spoken by Heim Weizmann and Lord Balfour. Heim Weizmann called to continue the pursuit and the process which the Balfour Declaration began. And Balfour's response was, if those efforts meet with all the degree of success which the Zionists hope for, 1917 will indeed be a date, a blessed date, not merely in the history of Palestine, not merely in the history of Jewry, but as I think and believe most firmly, in the history of the world itself. And I hope we all believe in this audience I believe we do, that we merit the description which you so generously gave us. Thank you for listening.
you. Thank you so much, Lord Rothschild. Thank you for the Rothschild family for being here. And uh, thank you, Lord Rothschild, for sharing your personal wor words and inspiring story that was truly a wonderful conclusion to this event. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. At this point, I would like to invite you to begin making your way to the Knesset Plenary Hall. Uh, the special discussion